So this demo is going to be focused on showing the differences between working with Grease Pencil and working with PNG sequences in Blender. So you know, it, it's a common thing for people to approach Blender thinking about uh, Grease Pencil objects. That's Blender's flagship animation feature where you can animate directly inside of the program. And you know, it has a lot of uh, positives, but it also has a lot of negatives. So I want to go over this test animation that I did here by pulling up the original file that I did it in real quick. Let me open recent. There we go. So we have this test animation that I did using Grease Pencil inside of Blender. And the main way I got this done was by utilizing sculpt mode. And if you were here last class, you should be a little bit familiar with sculpt mode. So first thing you should learn about Blender's uh, user interface is that there's different modes for adjusting different parts of your object and your scene. So you have object mode, which is the basic mode for moving stuff around. So I'm in a 3D scene right now. It looks like a 2D scene, but you know, if I grab this and turn on overlays by hitting this double circle button up here, you can see 3D scene. And if I'm in object mode, it's gonna show this highlight around my object that I have selected. So if I created a new object by hitting Shift A, so I'm just gonna create a cube. You see it has that highlight around it. Also, you're gonna notice that like my UI is slightly different than yours. I have like a green overlay. Just know that it's, it's not really super important, this difference. Uh, if you're ever confused about what I'm doing, then just holler at me. Say, what's, say ask what's going on. But just know the object that you have selected in object mode is going to be highlighted green. If I want to delete this, I just hit X, hit delete, and then it's gone. I also have, let me select this. I have edit mode, which allows me to interact with the different vertices on this grease pencil object. If you ever worked in a program like Flash, you'll be familiar with what's called vector drawing. Uh, it's different from bitmap drawing, which is, or raster drawing, which is what people are usually used to working with in programs like MS Paint or Photoshop, where you have pixels arranged in a grid, and you can change the value of those different pixels to get different drawings, and they all come together to create an image. That's not what we're doing here with Grease Pencil. We're using vectors, meaning that we're taking individual points. So if I have vert vertex select, on here, on my uh, top left corner of the screen, I have different options of what I can select and highlight. I'm in vertex select mode, and let me drag and select a bunch of the stuff. You can see I have all these little tiny points on my lines that show me that what Blender is doing to create my line is drawing lines between these different points. So that's basically how vector drawing works and how grease pencil works. Was, did you get all that? Yeah. Yes. Cool, cool. Oh, yeah. did we get another person? Yeah, nice. We got two more people. Great to see. So the positives of working with Grease Pencil is the vector drawing. It gives you more flexibility with what you can do in the long run. Like, if you notice these three frames that I start this animation off with, these are all one drawing. So you have this drawing and this drawing. And what I've done is I've gone into sculpt mode by hitting the drop down menu on the top left, selecting sculpt mode. And it gives me this little brush right here. If I want to change the size of this brush, I can either hit F to scale it, which scales brush, it scales brushes in both draw mode and sculpt mode. We'll get to draw mode later. Or I can go up here to the top left corner and I can mess around with this radius slider. It does the same thing. So what I did, I went to the frame that I wanted to change on my timeline, or in the case of using Grease Pencil, my dope sheet, it's ever so slightly different than your timeline. If you want to see me how to, you want to see how to get to the dope sheet in case like you want to set up and I can, uh, I'll show you later. It's fine. It's fine. So I went to the frame that I wanted to change in my timeline. So I had this frame, I went to my second frame and I used my sculpt tool. I selected the part that I wanted to drag and I just sort of dragged it to the place where I wanted to be. I have to make sure all my layers are unlocked to do that. So I just sort of dragged it to the place where I want it to be. 
and that allows me to make slight variations to my drawing. So if I wanted to do really quick in-betweening, I could do that just by going into sculpt mode after creating my extreme poses. Super flexible, super fast, incredibly powerful. But there is even more. I have access to my modifiers panel, which is this little wrench icon right here. I can add modifiers like the noise modifier that I already have in here. What this noise modifier does is pretty much create an automatic line boiling effect. So I'm going to go to object mode and turn off overlays and go to a place where there's a long hold, like right here. If you, I look at the timeline by sliding this up, you can see that these keyframes, for this distance in between, there's no new keyframes. But if you look at my drawing, you can see that my drawing is still changing. It's got a line boil effect on it, which I created using this noise modifier. So let me just get rid of that noise and add a new one by hitting this drop down menu right here. If I'm moving too fast, just you know, say something. I add this noise modifier. You see it's kind of moving a bit hectic. This isn't necessarily what I want. So what I'm going to do first is change its influence. And this is the difference between modifiers and effects, which is another thing you can add specifically to Grease Pencil to change how they work. And I'm going to get that, to that in just a second. I hit this drop down menu that says influence. I click this pencil icon that says layers. I choose the layer what that I want, which is my lines layer. And now it's only going to add noise effects to the line layer. So you can see that only the line layer is jittering around right now. But I think it's jittering a little bit too far, so I'm going to turn down the position slider. I'm going to turn it to something like, like 0.08 or something like that. And now if I slide here, it's still jittering around, but it's not jittering as much. I think it's a tolerable amount. But I kind of want it to be, I kind of want to change it so it looks like the jittering is a bit tighter, if you get what I mean. Like, uh, I'm going to go to draw mode to explain that. So instead of it being like, being like this, I want it to be like this. That is the wrong brush. So instead of it being like this, I want it to be like this, some tighter jitter jittering. So I'm going to go back to my noise modifier. I'm going to turn up my noise scale. And you'll notice that the space between these wiggly lines is getting tighter and tighter. I'm going to put it around 50%. And I like that. I like the result of that noise effect. And if I were to go here to my last frame in my timeline, I wanted to like extend this animation out, but I didn't want to add any new frames. So I'm just going to do that real quick. Going to my output properties and just extending the last frame. I could have this hold here, and now I'm jittering on this hold. So it's got this line boiling effect, but it's got a little bit more life to it than it normally would if I had this effect turned off. This is significantly more interesting than this. And the way that you would have done this previously as an animator is by redrawing every single frame of a hold. So you'd go every other frame in a, into a, a animated hold, and you just draw it again. And you do that maybe three or four times, and then you just loop those drawings. But now we can do that automatically with Blender. I also have access to my materials panel. So if I decide I want to change the color of a sweater, I can select the material that I want by going to this uh, checkered ball icon right here in the right side of my screen, selecting the fill color because I have this material set to be a fill. You have two properties with materials. You have your stroke and your fill. So what if I wanted her, her uh, the lines that I have for her sweater to be outlined, I could turn on stroke and now they're outlined. But I don't want that because this is just a fill color. I already have my lines. So I could go in here to my, my fill color for this particular material and I could change it so her sweater's red now. 
that's one big advantage with working with grease pencil. You can always go back and change your colors by just adjusting them, <laughs> adjusting a slider. Super easy. If I wanted to add some basic lighting effects, I could go to my effects panel, which is this little magic wand icon right here below your modifiers panel. I could hit this drop down menu and I'm gonna add a rim effect to emulate some rim lighting. Actually, you know what? Let's do this inside of that environment that I made earlier. So I'm gonna hit file, open recent, go to demo one, which is the one we're in. Let's not save that, I've already got things set up. Change it to rendered mode and give it a second to load up what I had. And let's turn it so that grease pencil object is visible. And there we go. So I wanna add some lighting effects to this grease pencil object. So I go to my effects panel I hit that drop down menu and I add rim. If I want to change where the rim is placed, I can adjust the offset of it by moving around these sliders. So I want the rim to come from the left side and the top. Maybe not be so aggressive. Let's go to a different frame in our timeline. I'm going to pull this up and I'm going to show you how to get different windows when working in Blender in just a second once we start working with the PNG sequences. If I want to zoom in on my timeline, I can just grab a point to it, grab a point far away and just bring it in closer to the beginning of the timeline. So yeah, I like the look of this lighting effect, but maybe I want it to be a bit more blurred out. I can hit this drop down menu, and if I want to change the X and Y of the blur, because the way blurring works in uh, Blender, you can adjust how much it's blurred in the X axis and the Y axis independently. I just grab one that I want to change. I bring it down, drag and hold, bring it down to the second one that I want to change. It should allow me to change both at the same time. It's not going to let me do that. Yep, there we go. So now I can change both at the same time. If I want to change the amount of segments, I can adjust my samples. So right now it's set to two. Let's make it a bit more fine. Set it to six. There we go. Neat 2D lighting effect. But there is a big downside to working with grease pencil that I think is very much worth mentioning. And that's that you don't have access to what is called the shader editor. So let me pull up the shader editor real quick. If I wanna create a new panel inside of Blender, what I do is I go to the corner of one of the panels that I have right now. When I'm talking about panels, I'm talking about like this viewport panel, this timeline panel, this uh, toolbar panel over here, my scene collections panel. What I do is I go to the corner of one of those until I get this little crosshair icon. I click and then I drag up and it creates a new one. If I wanna get rid of this, I go back to that crosshair icon right in the corner and I, oh, Sometimes it doesn't like to do what you want it to do and it'll create a million panels. I go there and then I drag it back down if it wants to let me do that. Sometimes Blender doesn't want to let you do it. There we go, sort of. <laughs> it's panel inception. Oh yeah, <laughs> there we go. So we have the one new panel that we want. If I wanna change what this panel is, I go to the top left corner of that panel. I click this drop down menu all the way in that top left corner and it will give me all these different options for what it can be. I wanna choose shader editor. Now we've access to the shader editor. So if I click my grease pencil object, you can see within it, I have what's called a principled BSDF, which is the most basic, but also like one of the most advanced shaders in Blender. It's pretty much just a shortcut shader. Like if you create a new mesh object and you just add a new material to it, it's gonna have a principled BSDF shader in there by default because you can adjust so many different things and get so many different options from this one shader. And like I'll use the word shader uh, interchangeably with this particular 
shader, which is the principal BSDF, as well as the shaders over here in my materials panel, when I'm talking about materials, I might use the word shader and material interchangeably. So just be aware of that and try to be on top of it. I'm, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll try to differentiate between shader and material. So it gives you this default shader inside of your basic material inside of a grease pencil object. But just know that this shader doesn't really do anything. So if I decide I want to delete this shader in here by hitting X, it's not going to do anything to my grease pencil object. It's not going to affect it whatsoever. And I have a quick question. Yep. What is a BSDF? Is that just a material or? I do not remember what it stands for, but essentially what it does is capture light information. So if I were okay. to create a, let me go over here and I create a new UV sphere and I add a new material to it. I have my principal BSDF, which has my light information. If I get rid of that, it doesn't get any light information. If I get what's called a diffuse BSDF, which is really Blender's most basic shader, and I run it through a color ramp. It's not gonna wanna do that because I'm gonna need shader to RGB. Don't worry about any of this stuff. I'm just trying to show you basic stuff of all a shader does is collect light information pretty much. Got you. So I wanted to ask that from what I'm seeing on the website, mm -hmm. it's mostly not, I remember what Blender was because Julian, uh, he was my professor like semesters ago. Mm -hmm. He mentioned using Blender for like a, for like an assignment that we were doing. Yeah. And um, uh, it was a three. It was mostly for like three D stuff. It was it's mostly for three D. It but is I'm mostly a three D program. To, yeah. I'm still trying to. Maybe I came in late, but I'm still trying to figure out. You know. So yeah, you're right. When you say Blender is mostly a three D animation program, but know that like recently they've upped the amount of features happening in their grease pencil mm -hmm. object which is the one that we are mainly talking about in this server and, and mostly right. going on but there are also other ways of using 2d animation inside of 3d environments or even just using blender's features in general to increase the quality of your 2d animations honestly I don't even really like thinking of blender as a 3d program just considering the sheer amount of things that it can do so, uh, I'm yeah, it seems yeah. like Blender, like from all the softwares that you know professional animators use, they don't use Blender like that. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of program in one small package. So, uh, let me finish up here. So, I was talking about shaders and how they don't right. matter with grease pencil objects, but the issue is, is that they can do a lot for your animations. Not having access to shaders mean you don't have access to things like normal maps. It, it means you don't have access to a lot of different lighting effects. Your options with Grease Pencil are gonna be significantly limited in that respect. Not that there's aren't, there isn't a lot of things that you can do, like messing around with different effects and modifiers using your Grease Pencil object can achieve a wide variety of different looks, but know that you are not going to be able to do some of the things that you can do with the second option we're going to go over. One big thing is grease pencil objects do not cast shadows. So if I go into this scene and let me create a new light object by hitting shift A, getting that drop down menu and selecting point light. Let's turn over overlays back on. It's going to make things a little bit easier. I'm going to hit G to transform and then hit X to only transform it along the x-axis. I'm gonna hit G to transform again, then along the Z, hit Z to transform it along the z-axis. I'm gonna go to my light properties while I have the light selected, which is that little light bulb right there. I'm gonna turn this up to 1000 watts. And if you look at the floor, you can tell that the grease pencil object is not casting a shadow. It's not influencing 
the objects around it with light information in any way. So if you're trying to make a grease pencil object seem like it's part of a scene, that's going to be very difficult to do. You might have to do some compositing uh, on the back end, which you might not know how to do at this point or not how to want to do at this point. So grease pencil objects might be a bit difficult at times, but that doesn't mean they aren't incredibly useful, incredibly powerful. Like, Using Grease Pencil has probably made me a significantly faster animator. I think I did this demo animation in only maybe a couple hours at most. So uh, let's look at the second option that you have as far as using 2D animation in a 3D scene. I I'm just talking about 2D animation in a 3D scene. There's other ways you can do it, even more options. But we're talking about comparing Grease Pencil and PNG sequences, which is what we're talking about next. So let me hide this grease pencil object and turn on this PNG object. Give it a second. There we go. So let me click this and go into its shader editor. And as you can see, I've already got some nodes plugged into it. I've already got some things plugged around doing some fancy things. So when you're working with PNG sequences, the way that you get them into Blender is First, you have to turn on Import Images as Planes in your preferences. The way you do that is by going to Edit in the top left corner of your window, hitting that drop-down menu, going to Preferences, going to Add-ons, and then hitting that search bar and hit Import or Images as Planes. There we go. Images as planes. Make sure that box is checked off. So you can check it on, you can check it off. Make sure it's checked off or checked, checked on. Make sure it is on so you can import images as planes. That's what I'm trying to say. And then you hit Shift A, you go down to image, hit image as planes. You find your image wherever it is or find your image sequence wherever it is. You select it. Go down to your last frame, hold shift, and then select your last frame. And then you check this box that says animate image sequences right here on the right side of this file explorer. And then you hit import images as planes and it will import it. I'm not gonna do it again because we already have it in this scene. But you'll notice that there's something a bit funky happening with this image sequence. Let me turn off overlays real quick and scroll through my timeline. And you'll see that the lighting on it is much different than what you would normally get with a grease pencil object. And that's because I've added what is called a normal map. If you've ever done game design or even like most 3D work, you'll be a little bit familiar with normal maps. The way they work is by essentially emulating depth by using a, a, a color image. So if I take my normal map, which is this node right here, which has my sequence of normal maps into it, they'll look like this. I'm gonna show you how to get these on your own in just a second. And I plug that into the color of my principled BSDF you will see that it looks like this. You'll see these colors pop up. And this is what's telling Blender, hey, everything that is on this particular side or everything that is using this particular color needs to be lit in this way. Treat it as if it's facing this direction. It's emulating beveling by using color. And if I change my camera angle, you'll notice that this is just a flat image. There is no real depth happening here. And let me show you how I made these. What I use is a program called Lighter. It's spelled in a really funny way, L-A-I-G-T-E-R, Lighter. And the way that I did that. What? Yeah. That's, a weird, that's a weird way to spell Lighter. It's a very weird way to spell Lighter. The way that I did this, I, I'll send the link to the program in the chat later on. The way that I did this uh, was by hitting this button in the top left corner, this import image button. I just select one. 
I hit open and then it'll give you like a little window that has the option to import an image as a sequence. It will say something along the lines of, I noticed that there were files with a sequenced uh, image name uh, in this folder. Do you want me to import them as an image sequence? And then you hit yes, and it'll import these as an image sequence. One thing you should know about Lighter though, is that it does not like bad hardware. So if you are running on crummy hardware, it's not gonna like you and it's gonna take a minute for your stuff to import. So I would recommend if you're gonna use this on a regular basis, maybe build yourself a nice little PC or something. <laughs> cause this took me quite a minute to render cause I'm running on my laptop right now. So it's not really that efficient of running laptops? Yeah, not on laptops, not on laptops, sadly. Even Mac? Yep, I, I'm running on a Mac. <laughs> But wow. beautiful thing about this is if I take this light icon right here and I drag it around, you can see that it's emulating having lighting effects on here. And the reason why Lighter runs so slow is because it's meant for video game sprites. <laughs> so it's meant for much lower resolution images than what I'm using and what you're likely using. You can adjust the different properties of your normal map in this bump menu over here. You can also get different kinds of maps. So you can get your normal map, your specular map, parallax, diffuse. It gives you a whole bunch of different options for what kinds of images that you can get out of here and you can use them for a ton of different things. I pretty much just use normal maps out of here. Uh, but once you have your images imported, it, it, it'll export them in just a hot second. It doesn't take that long once that's done. The way that I use them in Blender is by adding a image texture node. By doing that, I go to my shader editor, I hit shift A, I go down to texture, and then select image sequence. And then I can find it, I can import it in there, or I can go down to texture and hit image texture. I can hit this file icon, and then just find the image on my own. And the way that I use my normal maps is by finding that image sequence, importing it into this image texture, taking the color of that, and then plugging into the normal value of my BSDF, of my principled BSDF. But what I like to do is in between my image texture and my normal value is I like to add a hue uh, saturation value node because that allows me to change the intensity of my normal map without having to like re-render everything. So I can adjust the saturation of it. And if I turn down the saturation, it turns down the effect of the normal map. If I turn it up, it turns it up. I can also change the hue to change the angle of my normal map because the way normal maps work is uh, relying on color. So if I change the hue, it'll change what angle everything is at which you can use for some interesting lighting effects. Also, if you're gonna be using normal maps, or if you're gonna be using image sequences in general, let me show you the way that you set them up real quick. So we have this animation. I'm gonna create a new file. Let's save that, because I don't wanna redo that. I wanna have a nice thing to export after we're done with this class. So I'm gonna hit Shift A, go down to image, where's that? Image, import images as planes. Go to my desktop, art, navigate my f file hierarchy. Select all the images, animate as image sequence, import images as planes. Now I have to switch to rendered mode so if you haven't worked in Blender before, you have four different view modes that you can use in your viewport. Viewport is what I'm looking in right now to see my 3D scene. The way you access your four different render modes is by going up to the top right corner of your viewport window and selecting one of these four circles right here. So if I go to wireframe, I get the wireframe view of everything, which is the distance between different vertices, like what we talked about earlier. <clears throat> If I go to uh, workspace view or workspace shading, 
it doesn't apply any of my image textures or any of my textures in general. So it runs decently fast if you have very complicated scenes and you don't want to have to worry about like rendering every material when you don't need to. You have material preview mode, which let me scroll through my timeline a little bit so it actually renders it a little bit, which gives you a very basic view of the materials that you have in your scene. And you have rendered mode, which actually calculates the lighting but in a little bit less precise of a way than if you actually rendered things. So I've got this image right here. Let's scale it up so we can see what's going on. And as you can see, it's got no normal map happening. So let me find the light and move it around so we can really get a sense of it. It's just flatly lit, which is not what we want. If we're going to be using a PNG sequence, we want to have fun with it. So we go to that corner. Uh, I guess let me get my timeline back, I guess. We go to that corner. If Blender wants to let me do that, apparently it doesn't. Where's that uh, viewport? Come on, goodness gracious. There we go, we got one. Shader editor, let's go back to rendered mode. Click that, now we got our shaders. As a shortcut, I'm going to grab my image texture that I have inside of my shader editor. To move it around, I'm going to, uh, give me a second, I gotta get to the place I want. To move it around, I'm gonna hit G to move it into a place that's a little bit more clean. I'm gonna hit Shift D to duplicate it. I'm gonna hit that little file icon right here. I'm gonna go into my folder that says normal, which has my normal maps in it. I'm gonna hit the A button to select everything. Import image. Then I will hit Shift A to create a new hue and saturation. The way I got this little search bar was by selecting the search option at the top. Hue saturation node. Plugging it in here and plugging the output of that hue saturation into this normal option right here. There we go. Now we've got our normal map. I'm gonna adjust the hue around just a little bit. Let's uh, turn that hue down to zero. Yeah, and let's turn the saturation down to like 80%. There we go. And now we have our normal map functional. Is everything clear or do I need to go back over things? I feel like I might've been moving a bit fast. No, it uh -huh. seems pretty clear to me. Okay, okay. So now you have those options with normal maps. But as you'll recognize, I don't get the option to redraw my PNG sequences once I make them happen. So if you have a mistake uh, inside of your PNG sequences, like you want to change the color of something, you, you really don't have that level of flexibility to go back and fix things, not as much as you did working inside of Grease Pencil. So if you're trying to work on something very quickly and you know you're going to make mistakes, you know things are going to be shifting around, PNG sequences might not be the best way to go about it. But they do look really nice in 3D scenes and they do cast shadows, which is a big positive. Is there anything else you'd like to know about working uh, between PNG, PNG sequences and uh, Grease Pencil? And also, just so you know, you don't have to choose between one or the other. You can always like make a, an animation inside of a PNG or inside of a grease pencil, export it as a PNG sequence. Export it. Sorry, give me a second. You can make an animation as a grease pencil, export it as a PNG sequence, and then re-import it into Blender. That's always an option. So if you want that flexibility initially, and you just want to bring it back in, you can totally do that. My question is that when you um, 
like when you have it as a PNG sequence and it's casting shadow, is it going to cast a shadow over that whole plane or just the drawn object? Okay, there is a way that you adjust that. There is a way you can select between those two options. So if I create a new plane, you will see, if I bring that into position, you will see that it currently is casting a shadow using the entire plane, which is a problem. We don't usually want that. We want it to treat this alpha object, this, uh, this PNG sequence, as if it was an independent drawing and inside of our uh, scene. So what we're going to do is change our shadow options. And we do that material by material. We do that like by object. So what we do is we go into our material panel, like we did earlier with that checkered circle. We scroll down till we get to settings. And we go to our shadow mode. We're going to hit the drop down menu on our shadow mode that says opaque at the beginning. And we're going to set it to either alpha clip or alpha hash. I'm going to set it to alpha clip. And what's that? That's going to make it so our shadows are only created using our PNG sequences, non alpha places. There we go. Yeah, I think that's a pretty important thing to get across if you're trying to work with them. Alpha hash does yeah, a similar just, thing. I was wondering. I was like, if it's going to cast a whole plane, that might be bad. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't have to do that. Doesn't have to do that, most definitely. Yeah, yeah. Super powerful stuff, though. And there are way more shader options than just using normal maps inside of uh, using PNG sequences. Like, you have options for masking. Like, if you wanted to have part of your uh, character's a body to be metallic, but you didn't want to have to import a separate drawing, you can do that using mask. I don't have an example of that right now, but you know, if you ever want to see some different shader options using PNG sequences, I can definitely go over that. Yeah, that would be really cool. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> I wouldn't know that. my friend Alan, he has a, a YouTube channel. I think he did a video on that. I can send that to the chat later on. Definitely. Um, do you have a YouTube as I know you said you had a demo. Is that on a YouTube channel or is I, that on your? I do have a YouTube channel. Give me a second. I'm going to pull that up right now. You really want to die? Uh, goodness gracious. Seeing all my YouTube content. Let's go to my yeah, channel. Yeah, as much as subscribe to that premium, they're going to throw ads at you. It's fine. I'll live. Let me toss that in here. I'm going to toss that. There's my YouTube channel. I've only posted a couple demos, but I think they're pretty useful. Nice. Thank you. You are welcome. Factor. But you have a ton of options with what you can do using PNG sequences. Not as many options in Grease Pencil, but Grease Pencil is way faster. Uh, also, you have what's called a line art modifier, which I didn't get to show last class. I kind of want to show off real quick. It only takes a second. Let me create a new mesh object. I'm going to create monkey. I'm going to add a new modifier to this monkey, a subdivision surface modifier. So it's a nice smooth monkey. Set those levels up to two and apply. Then I'm going to create a new grease pencil object. And I'm going to create a new material in that grease pencil object. And then add the line art modifier to that grease pencil object. And now I'm going to take the monkey that I made, this Suzanne. I'm going to hit the M button on my keyboard. And that's going to allow me to put this into a new collection. There we go. Now it is in a new collection. Collections are kind of like folders, but they do way more than folders, like in Photoshop. So we might go over that if we ever want to do a demo on compositing, because collections are very important in there. But you know, if it's just for grease pencil, it only takes a second. So we could also change it so it either does it by object. <laughs> I, I kind of forgot. So let's do it by object instead of collection. We grab this eyedropper tool. Select our monkey. 
Then we select our target layer. First, we got to create a new layer inside of our grease pencil object. Select our target layer, and then select our target material, and then boom. What we have now is lines drawn on this monkey. Let's turn down the angle happening on this monkey line drawing. And let's bake it. Bake that line art. Uh, it's going to make me do all of the frames. That's great. So essentially, this just kind of allows us to put 2D lines over top of 3D uh, shapes. Incredibly useful. Definitely more useful for, than the old way that you had to do it using uh, what's called freestyle lines. Yeah, it kind of looks like a, well, like the tune shader in Maya, but a lot faster. Yeah. Lot faster. And you have different options, right? I'm going to turn this to shade smooth. So if I, that's, that's oh, not, whoa. that's <laughs> not great. Let's, let's scroll. Oh, it doesn't like that. It doesn't like that at all. Turn off overlays. Or I guess. We, yeah, it doesn't like me. <laughs> Sometimes it's a bit funky. It's a new feature. It's currently in beta. I'm using the beta version. And there we go. Now, it, now it's liking it. Now it's having fun. So you can put lines over top of 3D objects in Blender without having to draw them. Super quick thing I just wanted to go over last class. I didn't get the chance to because I was on different equipment. But there we go. One of the other things that you can do with grease pencils. And if you look at it from the side, it looks super funky. And that's why you have to bake it, because when you move the camera around, it needs to record all that information. There we go. Anything else? Any the, anybody confused on what we've gone over today? Or any additional questions of, of what you'd like to ask before we head out? <laughs> Uh, could you show one more time how you made the plane into just the 2D objects shadow? Yes. What I did was change the shadow mode. So if I go to my materials uh, panel and my, and my tools options, which is that uh, circle with a little checker happening on it, I also have to make sure that I'm selecting the proper object, the, the image object. I scroll down in that materials panel, and then I go to my shadow mode right here. I can change it to different options. I can change it to shadow uh, none, so there's no shadow casting. I can change it to opaque, which does shadow casting on the entire thing, and that's also the default option. Or I could change it to alpha clip, which is going to clip my shadows to the places without alpha channels. Uh, or I could change it to alpha hash, which is going to do pretty much the same thing. Uh, I know there's slight differences, and for some applications it can matter, but alpha clip or alpha hash will work if you're trying to use PNG sequences inside of a, inside of a Blender 3D scene. Got you. I understand now. Yes, power. We're all getting smarter here. <laughs> there we go. Anything else? Um, that's all for me, unless someone else has questions. Hmm. Yeah, come on. We had all this time. Shoot. How long did we take? We took an hour? Hour's not bad. Yeah, I think the last one was about an hour. Yeah. I think we are good, though. I think everybody is is pretty good here uh thank you guys for joining me thank you for ch checking out this demo if you guys have any other demos that you'd like to request please put them in the demo request channel and you know i'm completely willing to give what knowledge i have i'm definitely looking for more people who know how to use blender especially for 2d animation uh to come in here and teach them demos if they ever have time uh so if you feel like you're that kind of person feel free to reach out to me 
Uh, but thank you for joining me, and I will talk to you guys in the next demo. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've been silent, but I've just been absorbing like a sponge. <laughs> good, That's good. really great information. Thank you so much. You are welcome. I'm so happy to be of use. I can't wait to try this stuff out. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.